Okay, so once again, I'm Bonnie McIntyre. I've um, been at um, St. Brendan's now. This is our third week together for the Adult Forum series, the Lenten series. My uh, goal during this time is to look at some profound realities that we as Christians share. So our first week we talked about ministry and when I asked what your interests were I wrote down a whole list and one of them was grace and so that's what we focused on last week. Uh, another one was climate change or climate reality and so what I thought we could do this week is look at a context for this conversation. So um, we want to root everything in the prayer book and scripture. So if you have a prayer book handy, here you go Dad, uh, page 845, page 845, you got that Chris? Okay. Alrighty, everybody got a book who wants a book? Here you go. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we're going to start right off the bat with that first question here in the catechism section. I know most prayer books in most Episcopal churches fall open to 355. But during Lent, they fall open to 823 sometimes for right one. But what we're going to do is look at the, when we have been looking at various parts of the catechism. So what we have here is the first section on human nature. And so let's look at this together. What are we by nature? We are, help me now, part of God's creation. Okay, so that whole notion of creation is it, 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 foundational. It's the first question that pops up. It's exactly what we're talking about. So what does it mean, and made in the image of God, what does it mean? It means that we are free to make choices. Very important as human beings, we make choices. To love to create, to reason and live in harmony with. Creation. Yeah, it's not written in invisible ink, is it? I'm just checking. <laughs> Okay, with creation and with God. So those, that idea that we are, who we are by nature is part of God's creation. It doesn't say we're number one or the last. It says we are part of God's creation with the ability to choose, to reason, to create, and live in harmony with creation and with God. So. This is a kind of an interesting thing. My PhD is in social ethics, it's in theology, and it's, um, my uh, dissertation was in, um, in cosmology, social ethics and the return to cosmology. So I have been doing this cosmology business since uh, long before I graduated in 1990. This has been an area of deep interest for me. So uh, what I, we're going to talk about then is a climate for, uh, a, a context for climate reality. One of the big names that I care about is Tom Berry. Has anybody ever heard of Tom Berry? Yeah, tell us about him, Bridget. Um, well, he's dead. He was a bit of a, considered a radical, was he not? He was considered, yeah, radical. What do we mean by radical? Let's look at that. All you math wizards, what's the answer? Eight, exactly. And, and the relationship between eight and 64 is? Square root, okay, so it's the root. So, and this, this sign is called a radical. So a radical goes to the root of an issue. So yes, Tom Berry was a, a tremendous <laughs> radical. He questioned the foundations, he looked at what was going on. Okay, so yes, he was a radical. He looked at what are the foundations of our issues. Yeah, anybody else ever hear of Tom Berry? How about Bishop John Spong? 
We know it's John Spong. Tell us about John Spong. Um, I think he questions some of the uh, traditional thinking that some people have about He's another radical. If, as long as we stay up here and don't worry about anything and just mess with light dust, we rearrange the furniture on the Titanic, don't we? <laughs> but what happens when we go to the root of an issue? We uncover some things that we don't necessarily like or acknowledge or wish to acknowledge. And so, yeah, Tom Berry and, and uh, Spong are definite radicals. Now, there are others. Has anybody ever heard of Teilhard de Chardin? Teilhard. He was a French paleontologist. What is a paleontologist study? Fossils. There you go. Teilhard. And he died about 1955. And I'm going to refer to these guys. I'm going to refer to Tom Barry. Bishop Spong and Teilhard as we go along. So um, they happened all uh, to be priests. Um, he was a, a passionist priest, a Catholic. Teilhard was a Jesuit Catholic and Bishop Spong is an Episcopal priest. Now they're all men, but please don't hold that against me. If we had a part two, we could do the whole thing with all women. But these men happen to be pioneers. You see where I'm going with this? They are pioneers. Okay, so I think when we're talking about climate reality with Thaddeus in your midst, you don't have to wonder how bad we off we are, right? We are in bad shape. And if he's not in your midst, all you have to do is look around, read the paper, it's pretty clear. If you still read the paper. I know a whole lot of people, the what? You well, okay. So, we need to consider the magnitude of the events taking place in our times. What's happening now is not just one thing in a series of big stuff. But the devastation that we are seeing, that we are wreaking on our planet, is more than just another cultural change. What we are witnessing, we who are alive today and those who have been alive for a while are witnessing, is something that has never been seen before. In fact, it is the negating of what has been going on for some hundreds of millions or billions of years. What we are witnessing is something on a scale that has never been seen in the history of humankind, perhaps in the whole planet. This is a most momentous period of change. It is unparalleled in the four and a half or so billion years of history. So what has been going on and why is this such a big deal? Well, we need to look at who we are and why we are facing this big deal. We can look at this and I think as Christians we do look at ourselves as a chosen people. We are chosen to live in this time. And so since we are a chosen generation, we're a chosen human community, we can see ourselves much like the prophets. Do you remember the story of, of any, the call of any of the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, any of them? And what would happen? They would hear this voice of God saying, um, hey, Jeremiah, I got a job for you. And what does Jeremiah say to God? I don't think so. Uh, you barking up the wrong tree, buddy. What does God say? I don't care. Sounds like your mother, right? Do it anyway. And so that's what we're seeing in our own times. We may not want to have to deal with this, but sisters and brothers, we must 
deal with this. This is serious stuff. So, our generation, we have lived through a momentous period of change. We have gone through amazing discoveries of science. And we have seen the planet change as a result. You can think of any of the, the changes that we've seen. Can you name any for me? What have we seen just in our own lifetimes? What is it? Communications. Oh my God. You know, when I first started at Duquesne in 1990, those kids didn't have phones in their hands. <laughs> now, Tim knows, Megan knows, they can't get them out. They just can't get them out of their hands. They're like right there. And so we have seen all kinds of amazing things in communication. What else have we seen? Information. Yeah, because we have these little devices, we can contact anything. Used to be, imagine, you had to go to the library to look something up. The what? <laughs> I, I, one of my uh, um, colleagues and I were talking, and um, Holly Mayer, and she was saying, she has seniors, she has graduate students who have never been to the library. Well, if you can get it all here, why would you put your shoes on, put some clothes on, get out of your room, and walk over to another building? Why would you do that? So, we have witnessed things that nobody else has ever seen. In fact, we haven't just changed our lifestyles. We have changed the nature, the course of the entire planet. We have changed the very structure of the planet. And that's what that plastics thing is all about. How are we changing the structure of the planet? Well, let's think about the ozone layer. That has changed the structure of the planet. As we allow that to happen, we're seeing the greenhouse effect. It's with this climate change is one visible reality, but there is much more than just that. And what we know is that Situations like this have never happened in the course of human history or in all of Earth history. Now, you say to yourself, well, I remember, well, I mean, I don't remember, but I heard about, there used to be dinosaurs. In fact, in Oakland, where I live, you can see one. Now, it doesn't move. Probably a good thing. But we know, and people like, like Teilhard would know, that we had a time when dinosaurs roamed the earth, right? I think we all believe that. That seems to be the case. And there were lots of extinctions since the Paleozoic era. Have you heard of the Paleozoic yet? Okay, so 220 million years ago. And also then we moved into the Mesozoic era and we have seen amazing changes in the last 65 million years. But those changes are being extinguished. It has taken us 65 million years to get where we are and we are rapidly extinguishing much of what has happened. Now, we are not capable of extinguishing everything. No matter what we do to ourselves and the larger life forms, the bugs are going to be here. We are absolutely sure that nobody can squash the last bug. But we have set in motion forces that are extinguishing most of the major life forms and life systems that we, we stand to kill ourselves. How do we do that? How are we in the process of apparently killing ourselves? Well, we have poisoned our streams and, and lakes. We have developed nuclear bombs. The air quality here in Pittsburgh is like number 41 in the country and still we continue to make it worse. We can see ourselves doing bad stuff and what are we doing about it? 
So, during the last 65 million years, in this Cenozoic era, we have seen the full development of flowers. I went for a walk the other day around Oakland and Shadyside, and I saw the tiniest, most beautiful little buds on all the trees. Anybody been doing that? Checking out the buds every day? It's a magnificent time of the year. And you see every day more and more and more. And we know that the, how do they know when to come along? How do these buds know when to bloom? How, they do. And so we've seen all these processes going on, 65 million years or so. And then human beings came into being. And what we are doing as a people, as a species, is setting a reversed set of forces into operation. We've got a whole sequence going backwards. Nature, it seems, tends to get better and more beautiful. The trees here, when St. Brendan's was founded in 88, when were you founded? When did you start? Somewhere around 88. What is it, 87? 87, okay. The trees didn't look then like they do now, do they? There's m many more beautiful developments than you've seen. Everything is getting more full and, and beautiful, if left alone. But what we see, what we are doing with our poisoning of this and poisoning of that and nuclear threats and all that, is that we are negating, we are in a sense negating what has taken 65 million years to show up since the Cenozoic process began. And I want to suggest to you that this is the order of magnitude that we are talking about. We're not just talking about watching a film on plastics. We're not just talking about picking up trash or recycling the papers. This is an order of magnitude we cannot even probably comprehend. What is happening is not just happening to us, here at St. Brendan's, or us in the Western world. And it's not just happening to the human. We see it happening at the planetary level. What are some clues that things have been going bad for us, beyond us, but as a planet? To hear about the frogs, yeah, tell us. The icebergs melting, the polar bears. All that kind of stuff. It's not just about the human. What we are doing, what is happening, is happening at a scale that's been unprecedented. And so, all the human modalities of being that have existed in the past have been profoundly altered. All of them. We ourselves are being changed. Now, what about Christianity? What's happening to our religion? Is anything happening? Well, St. Brendan's is certainly doing a great job. We know that. So when did uh, Jesus and his friends walk the earth, roughly? Give me a ballpark. Let's say, yeah, 2,000 years ago. Let's use 2,000 as... So when we look at 2,000 years ago for, for Jesus, we had this whole biblical time period before then. And um, we could say roughly 3,500 years have elapsed since the biblical period started. Now, what we need to do is understand our prayer book, our Bible, our history on this new order of magnitude. We need to, and that's why Tom Berry as a radical, you betcha. We need to understand what we are doing and we need to figure out how is Christianity reacting. And 
if you're like me, we can't see a lot of our church leaders doing a whole heck of a lot that's significant about it. Would you say? I, I think that's a fair assessment. We are not seeing the major religions getting this scale of change. They are not doing much about this. So the planet is changing at an unparalleled rate. Our comprehension of it is much slower. We don't seem to be getting what's going on. And so doesn't it seem that if we are planetary beings, we are called to do something about the change and at least in the very beginning called to realize what this change is about. So what is happening to Christian theology? Christian theology, well let me ask you, what is theology? Theology comes from the Greek theos, God, and the ology, discourse on. So basically theology is not the study of God. You can't put God through a telescope or a microscope or, you know, turn the volume up and get the words. But basically what we're saying is that theology is discourse about God. So is our discourse about God keeping up with our understanding of our planetary changes? And one could argue, maybe not so much. And so, and it's not just Christianity. The Jews aren't, the Hindus aren't, the Muslims aren't. People are not keeping up with what's happening. But we see that this is the most profound change. What we're living through now, our generation living through now, is the most profound change in the entire 5,000 years of human religious history. And all human affairs are forced to change more than they've ever changed. We have to make adaptations like we've never had before. Think in terms of your parents. What kind of changes did they go through when they were your age? They're not like yours. Little things like they, they used to burn their garbage. Burn their garbage. Stopped. Rake their leaves, put them out in the front. Remember all that? Yeah, when we, were, when we were kids, we did all kinds of different things. Now all that has changed. And they, when your parents were your age, they didn't have probably all the phones and the communication and all those kinds of things. So when we're looking at human affairs, we're seeing that all human affairs are forced to change more than they have changed, and certainly since the larger civilizations came into being. Now, if we just take 5,000 years as a ballpark, even though Christianity is newer than some, we'll look at the major religions 5,000 years, pretty much. We could say that what they started out, what they saw their mission as, has in some ways been accomplished, including the Christians. The, the, these religions include the total understanding, the total religious experience of the human. And all that has happened in these past 5,000 years has been necessary for us to be at this point. How are we going to respond at this point is the question. So when we think about our Christian theology, our Christian civilization, our Christian background, what we see is that it includes the total religious experience of the human. It includes all the experiences of the human. And we want to maintain the goodness of that time. And what we know is that the major religions will have a role in shaping the future. What kind of role they have is the question. And what we see is that these religions have to adapt to the new reality. And it doesn't appear that they all have. And you may remember Bishop John Spong writing a book called why Christianity, remember that? Must change or die. 
Anybody remember that book? Yeah. Right. So what he's saying is, we cannot just put our blinders on and think we can do business as usual. There is much more going on. And so, the traditional religions uh, out of our existing resources cannot deal with the problems we have to deal with. We have to get out of our blinders situation and look at what's really going on. We have to get to the root of the problem. In a sense, we all must become radicals. Our own Christian resources are just not enough. And so, why is that? Well, when the Bible was written, they couldn't envision a time like today. When the prayer book, even in 1979, the latest revision, couldn't imagine a time like this. 79, think of all that's happened since 79. And so, what we're saying is, we have a new context, a new experience, and we as Christians must function out of this context. We cannot deductively get our guidance only from the past. We must look around us and view the world we're living in. That's what they did 5,000 years ago. This is what we must do also. So in a sense, we have and need a new revelatory experience. We have now a new sense of the universe with all the tools that we have. All, we didn't mention the telescopes, the microscopes, what's going on in medicine, in science. We, it's an explosion of knowledge. And have our religions taken account of that? It would appear, maybe not. I mean, they're trying, they're trying, and we're part of that attempt, but it doesn't seem like there's been that radical shift to the roots of looking at what does it mean to be a Christian today, given our present climate reality. And so, let's think about this notion of revelation. We, need, we know that God works in our present day. God is among us. God is with us. God is always showing us who God is. But we need to look at this, and we need to look at this, in the context of the universe story. What is the universe telling us? One thing the universe is telling us is that here on planet Earth, we cannot continue to beat it up the way we have, as if it will always be there. Now, when you think about creation, we tell the story in our language. When I came in from the car, I was hearing the birds. The birds are telling the story in their language. The trees are telling the story in their language. Anybody deal with trees? Anybody cut up trees and see how they tell us their story with the rings and all that? They t and they can tell when times were lean, when times were good. When they cut down like the redwoods and all that and they see what happened. We can read the story of the universe in the trees. The winds we can tell what's been going on in the way the world is operating. And so we can see that the universe story has its, we're part of the universe, it has its imprint everywhere. And it's important for us to know our own story as members of this planet, of this universe, this, the whole story. And in a sense, if we don't know the universe story, we don't know our own story because we are part of the universe. We are members of it. Now you may say to yourself, well, where is revelation? I don't get it. Where is revelation? Where's God? God revealed God's self to us in the book. Well, let's think for a moment about what is revelation. Revelation is the awakening 
in the deepest reaches of the human psychic awareness of a sense of ultimate mystery. Now, if we're too busy doing whatever we're doing, we may not touch into ultimate mystery all that often, but it's there for us. Perhaps you pray every day, every morning, every night, or whatever. If you don't just read words, but allow the mystery to wash over you, something happens, doesn't it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Prayer? You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes, you know, um, uh, Seely in The Color Purple, they're talking about this kind of stuff. And do you remember what she said? How do people contact ultimate reality was essentially the question. What did she say? Trouble do it for most folks. If you have a death or you have an illness, you get a diagnosis. You begin to ask questions. What are the questions we ask? You retire. You take a new job. You have a, a, the birth of a grandchild. All this changes perspective, doesn't it? Changes it. And so what you begin to ask, give me those basic questions we begin to ask. Who am I now? I got cancer, I got shingles, I got this, I got that. What? How, how am I? What is that? My husband, wife, sister, brother, father, mother, are not well. How does this change? I become, a, maybe I was a half orphan, now I become a full orphan. What is that? Do you know what I'm talking about? These kinds of questions penetrating our psychic awareness like nothing else can do. And so we talked about when the prophets began to talk about Revelation as they do chapter after chapter, person after person, and they saw this term, God says. What did they understand by God? Now today, I wasn't here when Regis was talking. What did he, did he talk about Exodus or the gospel, or what did he talk, were you, remember? The gospel, all right. Do you remember the first reading? Anybody here do the first reading? Yeah, okay. So that was Moses in the burning bush. It says, God called, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, we weren't there, I trust. And we don't know exactly what happened, but at some level, Moses heard something, didn't he? At some level, we experience the presence of God. Am I right? How many people would say, you have, at some moment in your life, experienced the presence of God. Yeah, it might have been watching a sunset, it might have been who knows where. Moses, we have a story of Moses experiencing the presence of God. Now, did you would swear on a stack of 80 Bibles that God spoke to you. Did God say, hello sweetheart? <laughs> How do you know that was God? What was your, how can you be so sure? You just know, right? You may not have gotten a telephone call. Hello, Gertrude, this is God talking, I need you to... No, that's trivializing it. You know something in the very depth of your being, and isn't that how revelation works, you know. And it's often calling you to do something, it's calling you to in this path and not that path. And when we say we pray about something, somehow we know. It's a special interior awareness. It's a depth of awareness we can't deny. And so when we're in our situations, that was the way it was with Moses and the prophets, and that's the way it is with us. We know. 
This is a revelatory experience that we have, whatever it is, God is revealing God's self to us. I would suggest to us that we are now in a revelatory experience and we need to listen to it. What is the universe saying to us? What is the earth saying to us? What is uh, what are our actions saying to us? What is the devastation that's going on in this earth saying to us? Are we being called to some qualitatively different direction? We know that God speaks to everybody. God speaks to the Hindus, God speaks to the Muslims, God speaks to this one, that one. Your ex, I don't know. God speaks to everybody. It's how it is. And faith is a word that reaches all primary traditions. We, it's in every primary tradition. Everybody knows faith. Now, you say to yourself, well, Monty, what about the scientists? What about them? Well, this is where we are. Science, in so many ways, has gone off in its own direction. It has not always reflected upon this interiority, this very deep awareness of the revelation of God. In fact, they kind of separated the two. Science went on their track and religion went on their track. And what we have seen is a disaster. We need somehow to get the, the genius of science and the genius of religion together. We know in science, I have a friend, um, you may know him, Paul Shepard at, um, at Redeemer. He's a retired physicist from Pitt. So people would say, well, what's a physicist doing going to church? It works for him. He's got that call to be a scientist. He's amazing. He's doing all kind of brain research now. And he's also a believer. The, it, it, it makes sense to him. He has trans-scientific implications for his life and his science. So when our belief can not be afraid of science, but can embrace science, we can make some progress. So when we think about gravitation, I drop it, it falls. That's an experience, but it's also in some way a belief. It is a mystery we cannot adequately deal with. We can't explain everything in front of us. And so we have ultimates of science that are trans-scientific. The scientists can explain them. I remember when my sister was born, my, um, now this was back in 1949, back in the stagecoach days, you remember those? <laughs> So she had, she went to the, the, they didn't have obstetricians doing all that stuff then, it was just a GP. And so he had said to my mother, you really should abort this kid, she's not going to make it. She's got all these problems. So my Irish Catholic mother said, if I'm going to lose my baby, I'm going to lose it the right way. Doesn't that sound like an Irish Catholic? There we go. So anyway, she um, delivered the baby. And so she said to the doctor, I, I thought this kid wasn't supposed to live. And he said, there are forces greater than we are. Every now and then, people have to, all of us, have to look at what is greater than we are. And so what happened in the early stages of Christianity? The early stages, the, our, our early, these, before the, the Christianity time, People were looking, we had, people were looking at the earth, kind of, they didn't have a linear sense of things. They had a, a cyclical thing, sense of things. And so then Christianity was born, still in this kind of um, circular, cyclical time. 
And Christian theology got born when the Greeks got in there with their science. That's when we got into the science of the early Greek fathers and the church. And when they got their knowledge and they got it together, life changed. There was a whole different approach to things. We had the biblical revelatory experience meeting up with Greek theology. And things in some ways exploded. It just got bigger and better. And that's what we seem to need now. We need to have our faith meeting the scientific revelation that leads us into places we could not have been before. Okay, now, Augustine, Augustine, uh, gave further development, Thomas Aquinas gave further development, Luther gave further development, and there was still uh, something together, but we have split and now the world as we know it through scientific observation um, has changed and somehow we have clung to and rejected much of the science. And today it would seem that we really need to do more than that. Now, I haven't given you one chance to talk and the time is pretty close to over. Does anybody have anything you wanna say? Has any of this made any sense? No. <laughs> yeah, Alan. Yeah, you can't. You can't hear me. I know he's so soft-spoken. Well, your PhD is in cosmology. My PhD is in science. Okay, okay. there we so, go. So I'm I'm one of them. All right. So, Good. Yeah. Yeah. We got uh, to be together. I, I really have two thoughts. Uh, one is. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the it, today we, we tend to deny things that are, are reality yeah. and uh, we're making a almost a religion of denying things that are reality yeah. if it doesn't fit what we want it's not true all right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, today in, in today's uh, post cassette they said there's a there's a front page story that says there are more highs in a in the year on particular days that is if in july the high was 102 and today it's 103 we've exceeded the high and if in january the low is minus 10 and we're at minus 12 there are more exceeding the highs than there are exceeding the lows now if everything was stable we do about the same number exceeding the highs and exceeding the lows and we're not okay so that means that we're gradually getting warmer and the result of that is going to be uh, food that isn't growing anymore here. Uh, wars that are happening because the people that don't have the food, that used to have the food and have an army, are going to go north to uh, conquer the lands that do have the food. Not so good. Uh, the second thought I had was uh, we had a children's service today. And what are we leaving to our children? Why, why are we doing this? Uh, you know, our children are going to pay the, the, uh, the penalty for, for our being, uh, uh, sticking our heads in the sand and not looking at what the reality is. And every time I see a children's service, I'm thinking of that. How are we? Uh, what what are we what are we going to leave to our children? Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly because what, what and how is religion responding? And how is religion responding? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Thaddeus puts before us the climate reality, but the content, the greater context in a Christian setting, it seems to me, is how are the churches responding? Where are where are we historically? What's been going on? And that rise of fundamentalisms because we want to cling to the past, we want to cling to what we had, instead of having enough uh, courage, in a sense, to go forward. Well, I think, like you said, sort of my question related to that, uh, why do you think that apparently so many of the fundamentalists, uh, Christian fundamentalists, want to try to ignore or deny the climate change. Well, look at the Taliban and all the rest of them. We know what we know. We don't know what we don't know, and we're afraid. But we have done so such a great job of denying that we're in the situation we're in, in large measure. So, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very scary to deny. Why do we do that? We're all like that. We don't want to change. We just wants to have all this paper going on and not use the prayer books and people go ballistic. Anytime we do anything. Look what happened when they said, said, oh my God, maybe we could ordain a woman. Well, what? Maybe we could ordain a gay person. A what? Oh my. We don't do change very well. Our species doesn't seem to do it. Yeah, yeah that is. Um, to put it in a local context, we talk about the evangelicals, we talked about the they, that they are amongst us. Um, and I happen to see that with Protect Franklin Park. And one of our members said uh, she's totally upset that her church, Ingemar Methodist Church, has decided to lease for fracking one of their properties.